Well, tonight I want to welcome you to Masada. Masada is one of the furthest, most southern, southern fortresses in all of Israel. It's out in the middle of nowhere. Um, you go down, you take a right, and you end up at the bottom of the road, and that's where you go to Masada. It's that bad. It's also a bit of a hike, and something that was humorous that took place actually here. This is my dad. So when my dad got to Israel, he realized that he had forgot some of his medication. And the one medication that he takes is to keep water off. Uh, a diet pill, or whatever you call those. Diuretic. Diuretic, that's what I'm trying to say. Well, <laughs> he forgot it. And the people on our trip were very kind, especially Tim. If you ever go, Tim's a fantastic guy, one of the most caring and kind you'd ever meet. Well, he knew we were going up to Masada, and he was very scared for my father, very scared. And so in a desperation, desperation he gave my dad a cane to walk with. Needless to say, it was unnecessary. My dad was fine. He was able to walk just fine, even without the diuretic. Um, but needless to say, he got called an old man quite a bit for the rest of the trip. <laughs> I gave him quite a bit of a hard time. What he actually ended up doing by the later on in that day, he obviously didn't need the cane. It was no big deal. And so he actually gave it to another lady who was much worse off than he was. But needless to say, I gave him a pretty good hard time about it. So where is Masada? Up way over here is Jerusalem, and you come over about 10 miles to the east, straight east, and then you head down a road that literally follows the edge of the Dead Sea. Now over the years, the Dead Sea has lost a lot of its water, whether through irrigation methods um, that the Jews use in northern Israel, or just the lack of rain, it's, it's slowly shrinking over time. The Dead Sea has no outlet. And so as the water begins to evaporate in the heat, the average temperature at Masada in a year, the average temperature is 106 degrees. Winter through summertime, 106 degrees. We were there at the end of November, after Thanksgiving, before Christmas. That's the cold time of the year. It was 85 degrees when we were on top of the hilltop. Yeah, it was bad. So as the water evaporates, it leaves all of the um, minerals and salts. And you actually, if you ladies use any materials, you can find the Dead Sea salts, and they're supposed to be very healthy for you. They are also a very lucrative business that you pay a lot of money for. I didn't do it, but I know people that did. I will leave them out of the picture, or at least unnamed. Uh, if you remember, these are some of the places we talked about. Here's Qumran, where we talked about the Dead Sea Scrolls, where they found most of the scrolls of the Old Testament, in fact, nearly all of them in perfect order. And that was by the Essenes. We talked about that place. Then down here, this is En Gedi. This is the oasis that David hid from Saul. Remember, Saul went into the cave and David cut the hem of his garment. That took place here in Gedi. Well, then you keep going down to the middle of nowhere and you come to Masada. Now, this is topographical, okay? The Dead Sea is the lowest place on earth. It's 1,300 and change below sea level, okay? But then if you notice this topography, it lays out pretty flat and then all of a sudden it just goes straight up. And that's where Masada's at. It's on the straight up, about 60 miles uh, south uh, southeast of Jerusalem. Now, do you see in this picture a fortress anywhere? As we're driving down this road heading south, they said, hey, look over there. There's the fortress of Masada. I didn't see a fortress of Masada anywhere. <laughs> So I took a picture in the general direction of where they were describing it to us, and by my fortunate guess was all ahead, I was right. This is Masada. And actually, right up there, you can barely see a little bit of a notch, two notches. That's actually the fortress itself. That's the palace of Herod. Um, 
It's a place that you can see a fortress there, and you can't see a fortress, if you know what I mean. <laughs> I, by chance, got the picture of it, but it was only by luck. It's, I cannot describe to you in pictures how immense this place is. I could give you the best of pictures that I have, and you would still not comprehend how gigantic that is. We are easily four or five miles away at this point, and that's how big it is. The top of this thing, I'll talk about it later, but the top of this thing is 18 acres on the top, and it's a plateau, okay? But this will give you an idea. Right there, just shy of 1,400 feet below sea level, you go three miles, and it's already 187 feet above sea level, okay? Then you go a little bit further, approximately 15 miles, you're at 2,200 feet. The elevation change is massive, massive. It's roughly 1,600 feet in elevation drop in three miles. That's going straight down the mountain. But beyond that, as, you show, as I was showing you in the picture, most of this is all flat because that used to be Dead Sea until it dried up. And so you come to nothing and then it goes straight up 1,600 feet. So even saying 1,600 feet in elevation-ish in three miles isn't even really true. It's much less than that, really. So let's talk about the Dead Sea just a little bit. It's very easily seen. This is the visitor center at Masada. We are going up the sky lift. They have a path you can take called the Snake Trail. Um, but there's also, and that's how they used to get up there. They were stout people, I'm just telling you. <laughs> um, but they also, they have a sky lift. And it's every bit as big, probably bigger than the one that's at Natural Bridge. Probably about twice as big as the one that's at Natural Bridge that takes you up. And this is as we're going up in elevation. And you can see right here, here's the Dead Sea. This is when you are at the top, when you're finally on uh, Masada. That is the visitor center, way down there. And then you can, again, you can see uh, the Dead Sea off in the distance. By the way, just to give you an, another idea, it is in this general direction, and it is my personal belief, it doesn't have to be yours by any means, where lots of people disagree with me, but it is in this general area where God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay? And... My personal belief is it was in this area here and over on this side, there is white limestone that is very unique to that area. And the shapes are, they're not flowing like a river. They're more squares and looks like man-made uh, right angles. But you can take that what you will. That is totally up to you. Uh, do your own research on that one. Here is that other side um, that, you, that I was showing you, and you can see how much lighter that color is than the rest of the rock that's around uh, the area. And these are just pictures of the Dead Sea. Flavius jo Josephus Flavius was the first, first century historian. He was first a Jew, got captured, and then to save his life became a Roman in a quick hurry. But he became a historian and much of what he said is very accurate. And we're going to go back to several of his quotes because most of what we know of the siege of Masada, uh, Josephus is the one that's written it. And this is what he says here. A rock of no small circumference and lofty from end to end is abruptly terminated on every side by deep ravines. The precipice is rising sheer from an invisible base and being inaccessible to the foot of any living creature save to two places where the rock permits of, of no easy access. And this is kind of a, this is a rendition that they have inside the Welcome Center. So you can kind of see here is the top of Masada and you can see how fast it falls off. Very, can you imagine building a fortress there? You'd think impregnable, right? Unless you're Romans and you're really angry, and we'll talk about it. <laughs> All right. Uh, according to Josephus, between 37 BC and 31 BC, Herod the Great built this large fortress. 
um, as a refuge and a plateau escape for himself. You remember how we talked about before that Herod the Great, just before Christ, was very paranoid. And so he built palaces and fortresses for him, for himself all the way through his kingdom. We talked about Caesarea Maritime, where he made the capital and that massive dock that was a feat of nature. I mean, a marvel of the ancient world. Okay, so he built that. Then he built a place called the Herodian. Um, we really haven't talked about that in Rabbit Trails because right after we got back, I did a sermon actually on the Herodian and Herod the Great. But that's over by Bethlehem. It actually overlooks Bethlehem. It overlooks Jerusalem. And it's a massive mountain in the middle of nowhere. Then he also built this place, Masada. So he goes from the north to the middle to the south. And there's actually another one further south. Um, and for the life of me, I can't remember the name of it right now. But there was another one that he built way further in the desert. Just so if people revolted against him, he had a place to run. What they ended up doing after he died, when they decided to revolt, they used all of those places as fortresses to defend themselves, even though the Romans still came to wipe them out. They worked great for the people that did want to revolt, and that's how they used it. It had two play, it, it had an endless supply of food, and we'll show you some of those. This is an actual area. I did not take this picture, just to let you know. <laughs> um, I couldn't quite reach that far for the selfie. Uh, my selfie stick didn't make it that far. But you can kind of see, this is all of the ground down below, and then the walls just go straight up from there. And you can see erosion over time too, but even with that erosion, you can imagine 2,000 years ago how absolutely impenetrable this place was. It had it designed in it, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, crevices along the side of this precipice that would collect the rainwater, and the rainwater would be diverted down into cisterns to uh, help water help water the people and their crops and their animals, uh, those that lived up here. And like I said, this is roughly 18 acres on top. This is an actual picture, and I could go dis and describe to you all of these little places, but I'm not going to. I will give you this way over here. This is Herod's palace. He had out there way in the end, and I'll show you a picture of it. He had a palace section that overlooked the whole precipice. I mean, you could just look straight down. And he called it the hanging palace because it kind of hung on the side of the mountain. It was really incredible. Over here, uh, this is where they had their food storage. Over here is, uh, wait, 23. I take it back. I think 23. Yeah, excuse me. This is the area that was taken uh, by the Romans when they besieged the city, and I will show you that as well. But they had just amazing things. There was, uh, I will show you, no, nope, 27, Dan. This is the barracks. I apologize, that's not what I was actually looking for. Here's a smaller palace right here. Here's a small palace. Uh, one of those was for the commander who lived uh, up there and who was in charge of the army that was stationed there during the time. And so here let me show you some of the palace, okay? Here's the palace complex. This is a rendition, obviously. It's not the real one because it's kind of small. But this is the hanging palace. And he had the rest of his palace over here, but then you had these really nice views that stepped down and literally hung right on the edge of the fortress. And it was straight down, 400 meters. Yeah, you had a view, that's for sure. Um, Alexander Yanaeus was the first century was in the first century BC. Um, however, there aren't any buildings that are, that are here from the Hasmonean period that he built um, and fortified that remain. All of those have been uh, destroyed. Uh, Josephus writes that Herod the Great captured it uh, in a power struggle and that followed in the death of his father Antipater. He, uh, Antipater, excuse me. That was Herod the Great's dad. In this battle, he died or because of it. And then he took over. <coughs> and it became his. <coughs> and then he put it into, uh, he made it into himself, for himself. 
Uh, I don't actually know why I had the picture there. It does not belong there. That is the commander's room, and I put it in the wrong spot. I apologize. This is overlooking. <laughs> Can you imagine? This is the hanging palace there. <laughs> and look. Up. All right, those are people. I'm on the second story of it. You go down one, then you go down another, and then you can't even tell what that is down there. <laughs> it's so high up. Hmm. Now, did they actually raise crops and cover it? They did raise crops, as a matter of fact. They did raise crops, and it was watered from cisterns. They had very little rain, obviously. I mean, you can tell. There's not much that grows up here. <laughs> it is. It's a, it's a dead rock. In fact, well, I'll show you that in a minute, too. No, I don't think so. I think they ground what they had, to be totally honest. But I don't know for sure. Uh, here's another picture of just the sheer edge of it. It's, it's just an incredible uh, work of art. These are some of the floors. Notice the mosaics. These are little pieces, and I mean, they're smaller than my thumb. And they have them designed in just beautiful uh, works of art. Just, I mean, look at that. It's just ex excellent. What they did is they would take a rock bed. They would make a rock bed, and they would put it like what we would a wall. Then they would um, plaster it, and then they would put their tile on top of that plaster and grab them in. It was, it's incredible. And it's, that was just how they did it back then. It was, it was beautiful. So, well, and here, you can kind of see it. Here's the rock bed with the mortar, and then they put the plaster in. Then they put their... Mosaics on top of that. Must be good to be the king. But when you're looking over the edge, that first step, it's a Lulu. <laughs> See how, by the way, um, isn't that just beautiful? Isn't all the trees and flowers and ain't nothing there? I mean, it is all just dead and dry. Not a place that I would want to go to vacation, but apparently he did. Uh, there was a bathhouse in it, which is just incredible. So here's how they built the bathhouses back then, and this is what they found in archaeology. You would have the water run through in between these pillars, and then they built on top of these pillars their floor, then their tile on top. And so the, the floor tiles, I don't know why you would want it, but they would be heated, they would be warmed, I mean, it would have been awesome, and then it would have made steam, obviously, at 106 average degrees in Fahrenheit. It would have made us a steam room, but that was their bathhouse, and it was just, it was incredible, and that's what they found. And here's where the water would have exited and flowed through. But if think about this, you, that's like a foot and a half, okay, the pillars. We're talking about a place that has no water. But Herod the Great was such an architect, such a builder, that he could build places like this. And believe me, we ain't, not, we ain't done yet. This is... Say what? Exactly. Seriously, fighting over a rock. That's exactly it. Here you can see the, um, the floor and then the tile that they would have laid on top of it. And there's actually a piece right on top of that pillar. But that's how they would have done it. Here in, this is also in that same bathhouse, you can see the intricate triangle tiles uh, placed into the, into the um, plaster. Here's obviously a bathtub that's, you know, it's been destroyed over years. But notice the sides too. Look at the beautiful paint. This is 2,000 years. The beautiful paint that's there. It's just it's absolutely incredible. All of these stone walls, they had plaster that came up, and then they had them painted. Now, of course, we couldn't walk over and touch them, which I would have loved to have done. But Is it lead free? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. if they, I would say they probably had lead free, but I'm not sure. If they didn't, I mean, if they did, I would say it's probably why Herod got so crazy. He was probably eating the chips off the wall. <laughs> but, you know. Just, I mean, look at those reds and the yellows. It's, it's just gorgeous after 2,000 years. So here's the commander's home um, where they did excavations. And unfortunately, I beg, I'm sorry about the glare. <laughs> it was kind of hard to find shade up there, just to let you know. 
this was, it's got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 rooms, or at least sections. Some of them were open to the other ones, but this guy had a massive house. Um, this was a nice place. And this is, like I said, that other picture was supposed to be here, but that's what it looks like going in. You can see the pillars and what it would have looked like. Here's some more of the pillars. All of the stones built up and then all of them plastered. All of the walls up here, it's the king's place. They're all plastered and painted and looked good. Um, some of them etched for design. Here's the post for a door. You can see that. But to have all of that and to have a thousand people that live up there at any given time, you had to have a maximum amount of water. And here's one of their cisterns. They obviously didn't have much to go, I mean, you can't go down to the Dead Sea and draw out water, and you're 15,000 whatever feet down, it's not that many, but you know, 1,500 feet down to get to water. You can't dig a well, so you have to have cisterns. It's all gotta be cistern water. So what he did was he built elaborate trenches, what we'd think of as gutters, and then also aqueducts on the side and in this mountain that would feed down into these massive hand-carved caverns that would hold up to 200,000 gallons of water. 200,000 gallons. Here's another picture of it. Just This is same place, just different orientation. Now, 200,000 gallons, that we know that's a lot, but let me put it into perspective. So my dad used to work in the oil field, and when you pumped oil, you had to drain the tanks. There would be water that would come up with the oil, and you have to drain those tanks. If you can picture in your mind the oil tankers that drive, some, you know, the semis that drive on the road that would also fill, you could fill them with water, etc. They hold about 7,000 gallons. So picture in your mind, just shy of 30 of those trucks in a row is what he built to make capable of holding water. That's a lot of water in the middle of nowhere. This is one of those uh, trenches uh, that I was talking about. We call it a gutter, <laughs> whatever. This is a artist rendition, but it does show you, here's the water. And what he did is he just notched them out of the side and then they would flow down into the cisterns and that's where they would collect their water. It, <laughs> no, they don't. But I think they were just trying to grab whatever they could. This is actually that water trough. This is the aqueduct that he built. And you can see he dammed up the side, put rocks on it, plastered both sides of it. So as the water would trickle down off the side of the mountain, they would go into that path, go down in the cistern. Do any of them still hold water? Uh, I don't know. I, I wouldn't think so. I'm sure they still hold water, but they don't get much of it to hold. So, so they got a lot more rain back there. Uh, probably. I would think they would have to because I don't know how. I mean, when we were up there, of course, we were up there at wintertime when they are supposed to rain. They said that in the there's only 52 days a year that are supposed to get rain, okay, that you have the potential of getting rain. So, you know, whatever that is. And on any given day of those 52, you had a 12% chance of getting rain, and it was less than a half an inch. And that was rain or snow, whatever it might be. So you didn't get nothing. Uh, here's another picture of that um, aqueduct and going down into the cistern. Now, right here, and I'm going to mention in a little bit, this is called the Snake Trail. It is a sidewalk that they made that was nice. Now, and I say nice, and none of us would want to climb it, that was skinny as all get out. It wound around the mountain, and you went up kind of in a, in a circle to get up to the top. And that's how they did it back then. Because there's no other way up on this mountain. Can you imagine trying to be the army that decides, okay, we're going to go take this thing. And the only way to get up there is these two little paths that two people can't walk side by side. It just doesn't work. <laughs> and you're going to try and take that by siege. All right. Um, this is talking about the snake path. This is Josephus again. The former path they call the snake, seeing a resemblance to an animal in its narrowest and continually windings, one traversing it must firmly plant each foot alternatively, 
Destruction faces him, for on either side yon, yon chasm so terrific as to daunt the hardiest. He enclosed the entire summit in a circuit measuring seven furlongs with a wall of white stone twelve cubits high and eight broad on it with thirty-seven towers fifty cubits high from which access was obtained to apartments constructed around the whole interior of the wall. In layman's terms, you had that path that you had to plant your feet firmly or you were going to die, even if for the hardiest of persons. Beyond that, on top of this plateau, he builds another wall with 37 towers, 5 cubits, which is 18 inches, so 18 times 5, whatever that is, tall, and he puts houses in the center of them. So what they would, it's called casement walls, and we've talked about them several times. You had a wall, a house, and a wall. So if you were being besieged and they got through the first wall, you'd excavate yourself from the, ha from the houses, board up the walls, and then they'd have to fight through that too. It was very difficult to get through. He built that on top of this thing. He was a paranoid man. But to beat all, Again, we're talking about a place that doesn't get any rain and they got to beg water for cisterns. It's good to be the king. Do you see what that says down there? Yeah, the guy built a swimming pool on top of Masada. With as hard as it is to get water, he built himself a swimming pool. They get an average of less than five inches of rain a year. Less than five inches. And the guy builds the swimming pool. Not to mention his bathhouse. Like I said, there was at least 18 inches that the water would flow through underneath. It was a very elaborate city. There were synagogues. There was quarries. There was brick making ovens. Um, there was massive amounts of infrastructure. And you can see as you're walking down this little town, you see the, the, the houses along the side. And then there was also houses in on the walls, as I mentioned earlier. But, I mean, just look at all of the work. All of these stones that you see, they quarried from on top of that mountain. They did, you couldn't bring them up. You couldn't bring up materials. So you use what you had, and in, when you go in the center of the plateau there, in the 18 acres, they just started digging straight down, and they pulled the rocks out and put them on the sides of the wall. Look at all the clouds. Ain't none. <laughs> Nary one. These are just, uh, we'll talk about this place in just in a minute. Uh, we're going through. This is walking through the city itself. This is a really neat place. This, there is three of these little places. They're towers that are built unique to anything else. The walls are circular, okay? And you have these walls here, but then you have these bricks with these holes in them. And they would lay them with the holes purposely in there. Well, what they were, and you can kind of see it better here, it was for doves. And what they did is they raised the doves inside these towers, and the doves would live inside these holes. Well, they got to eat a lot of dove meat, because that's, when you're up there, you can't feed them grass, right? So you raise doves, the doves are raised, you eat the doves, and then all the dove poo that lands down here, they'd scoop up as fertilizer for their gardens. <laughs> Pretty ingenious. Pretty good thinking. I wouldn't have thought of it. But, yeah, that's what it was. And they had three of them up there. Um, besides being a great picture of some guy named Gunner's feet, uh, beyond this fence looks into the quarry, uh, where they dug all of the stones out. I have no idea why we took a picture of Gunner's feet, but we did. Here's a better picture of the quarry, as you can see it, and this is where they were digging out. Here's the rocks. They went all the way along here, but it was all across the center. These are, this right here is the Byzantine gate. This is where the Romans came up and first entered in the siege that we will talk about in a second but that's all that's left of it 
As I said, all of the walls were plastered. And notice how they did the plastering. They made it look like nice big blocks, uh, Herodian blocks like we saw in the Temple Mount um, structure. Same, same idea. Just beautifully ornate. This is one of the guard houses. Um, and you can just see how they etched it out. It was, it was gorgeous work. This is a Byzantine church. This is an oven. And look how they did the uh, stones on it. It's really neat. They did a really neat stone design um, that was left there. This is a man, while we were there, who was repairing the walls. To be more precise, he was actually fixing the chinking in between the, the stones. But it just kind of gives you an idea. These are the houses. This, remember how I said it, it was called a casement wall. This is the outside wall. You went over this, it was straight down. Then you had a house. Then you had another wall. And so if they came over that wall, then they had to fight through here. And then they still had to fight through here. And they actually found a bunch of scroll fragments and other things in those, in those rooms that I just showed you there. It was pretty neat. And this is actually kind of a picture of one of them right there. Oh, look, there's rain clouds way over there. But we didn't get any rain from them. <laughs> can you imagine? But look at, look at the view. Isn't that gorgeous? I mean, you can see literally forever. Because, <laughs> again, this is like three miles, and this was actually a hazy day. It was kind of humid and hazy. And this is actually uh, the country of Jordan over here. The children of Israel would have marched up through that way and they would have come to the far side over there of the Dead Sea uh, to come across the River Jordan. And here again, this is that the, the gate that was besieged. And like I said before, notice how white that stone is compared to the rest of the rocks here. It's very, very unique. But you can do your research. Here's the storage complex. They had a massive amount of food at any given time so that they could feed a thousand people two to three years. Because the only way you were ever going to lose a battle on this mountain is if they starved you out. So what do you do? You build up all kinds of food. And this is the storage complex. You can see how tall these walls are. Now this is actually a hallway in between them. But this is the storage complex and how tall and wide they are. Okay? And these would have been packed with food. This is what is left of those storage rows. And we will explain why in a minute. This is looking down on their storage facilities. They had these massive bays of food. Notice this one we, already, we just looked at a little bit ago. This is the only one that is intact. It's the only one that was not destroyed. And I'm going to explain to you when we come to a close why that is. But you can see the person walking there. These walls are easily 10 foot tall, 6 foot wide, and like 30 or 40 feet long. Maybe even more than that. It would have held a massive amount of food. And again, you can see that they were all plastered walls. They look very nice. In it was also a synagogue down here. This is a mikvah. Uh, needless to say, it was only for one person. Normally, if it was for more, you would have two bays, and we've talked about that in the past. This is what the synagogue would have looked like. You remember when we've talked in the past, our idea of church is a pulpit in the front and people in the pews looking at the pastor preaching. Not so here. They would have stood up here, and then everyone around them would have been looking on because it was more corporate than it was... You know, just feed me. It was, we're going to feed each other, was the idea. And this is some of the, these are the seats, obviously, and there's the posts that held the roof up. You see that. So now we get to the worst part of the story. Josephus Flavius said, The Roman general advanced on the head of his forces against Eliezer and his band of Sicarii, who held Masada and established garrisons at the most state suitable points, threw up a wall all the way around the fortress to make it difficult for anyone, any of the besieged, to escape and post sentinels on the guard, to guard it. He himself encamped 
at a spot which he selected as the most convenient for the siege operations, where the rocks of the fortress abutted the of the hmm, where the rocks of the fortress abutted on the adjacent mountains. For in rear of the tower, which barred the road leading from the west to the palace and the ridge, was a projection of rock of considerable breadth and jutting far out. Silva, who was the captain, having accord accordingly ascended and occupied his eminence, ordered his troops to throw up an embankment. Down here you can see some of his, to this day, you can see where he camped. There's three here. And this one down here. These are three of them. There were eight in total that encompassed the entire fortress of Masada. Now you can also see that little thin red line right there, that is a wall that they built that went all the way around the entire thing of Masada. And then he posted guards around that. The idea was to tell everyone looking down, there is no escape. There's nowhere to run. You're going to die. In 66 AD, a, Jew of, a group of Jewish rebels called the Sakari overcame the Roman garrison at Masada with the aid of a ruse. After the destruction of the second temple in 70 AD that we talked about two weeks ago, the additional members of the Sakari fled, fled from Jerusalem and settled here on top of Masada. They had to slaughter the Roman garrison, which they did by trickery, and then they held it as a last-ditch effort, as an Alamo, as it were, uh, for their rebellion. By this time, the, the Romans in this siege came down from above in 66 and have wiped out, we talked about um, Magdala, remember where Mag Magdalene was from, and they had the caves where they lowered the archers down and killed everyone in the caves. They started at the top, they worked their way down. In 70 AD, they got to Jerusalem, they killed a million people indiscriminately, and now they're moving now further south, right before this. And I've got it. Oh, yeah, here it is. Um, they're called the Sakari here. They were the most severe. They were a more severe sect of a group that we know very well. They're called the Zealots. Do you know why we know the Zealots? Simon the Zealot was one of the disciples. They were revolutionaries. This group, the Zealots... They stationed themselves in En Gedi. You remember where I showed you En Gedi? It's just north of here at Masada. They stationed themselves there. On the way down to Masada, the Romans found them, and they massacred 700 women and children there at En Gedi, that beautiful oasis. They were taking very few prisoners. Here's, some, here's the up-close picture. You can still see the rocks that they have piled up for uh, the Roman camps. And there you can see it again. And also here. Some of the rocks in the back I have from those places. This is from the fortification walls of Masada, and you can still, you can see them, and you can see that wall that goes all the way around. And those are the encampments there. This is on the east side. I will show you the west side in just a second. Here is the west side. The leader, his name was Silva, Lucius Flavius Silva. He headed up the Roman tent, Fatensis. That was the ones that destroyed Jerusalem. And now he was going to make a full sweep and wipe out the remaining um, thousand people that were on top of Masada. Do you remember last week when I showed you a picture, a map, of the top of the Temple Mount? Do you remember how I showed you that it wasn't square, that it was kind of tilted as a rhombus or whatever it was that we talked about? This was where Silva rested, and it's almost identical to what you see on top of the Temple Mount. It looks very much like a Roman garrison. You can take that for what you will. Needless to say, the Tenth for Tensis by this point had some 15,000 people in its group. Eight groups stationed all the way around the encampment. You can see here, here's another part of that uh, wall. And I showed you the pictures. I mean, 
When they built a wall, they built it all the way around. It was a massive feat. But they did it on the side of a cliff. <laughs> there was nowhere for them to go. They had somewhere around eight to 9,000 that were fighting men. The other six were all of the slaves who had been captured and not killed in the previous battles. The idea was, we're going to take you prisoner and we're going to make you watch as we kill everyone else that's left to rebel against us. They didn't like rebellion. Here is Silva's camp, just overlooking. Over to the left here is where they would, where they're going to bring up the siege ramp. This side is obviously, it's like 300 feet taller than the other side, so they built the ramp here. But again, you can see the, the wall that goes all the way around. And there's another one of the camps, by the way. Even though there were 15,000 Romans in for this siege, there was less than 1,000 people on top of Masada, of, including women and children. And it took the Romans almost two years to take Masada. It was well made. <laughs> Here's another part of that retaining wall that you can see there. Some of it's now broken down. But that was just a way to say no more. So here we go with the ramp. This is how they finally finished the people off. This is the side of Masada, and then here is the other uh, mountains coming up. This was the closest because it was 300 feet higher than the rest of the junk on the other side, so they built it here. But unfortunately, this picture does not give the ramp justice. It looks like no big deal. This next picture, though, shows you how massive it is. This ramp, I cannot describe to you how big it is. I can give you the measurements, but you can't process it in your mind until you saw it. This is if you're looking from the Roman camp going straight up. This is where they dis this is where they broke through. Okay, it's a 20 degree incline going up this ramp where they could have pushed up their siege ramp. It goes up, or excuse me, it's 200 meters or 650 feet wide. Okay. All of this is man-made. They did this by buckets. 650 feet wide, it goes up from base to top, which it's, you know, it's falling as uh, erosion and deterioration. But up from here to here where they built it is 1,968 feet. It's taller than the Empire State Building. If you were to lay the Empire State Building on here, you'd still need more room to go. It went in elevation 200 feet. It took them two and a half months to build. Two and a half months to put that much dirt bucket by bucket on that wall. Now I want you to think about a soldier, a Roman soldier at that. Every, huh? <laughs> yeah. Every day you get up for two and a half months straight, bucket after bucket. And you know what the archers are doing on this side? They're picking you off like targets. Every day you get up bucket by bucket, pouring out the dirt, pouring out the dirt, getting shot at, getting shot at. Some of you getting killed time after time, after time, after time. Two and a half months straight. But this was the view of what the Jews saw. And think about their view. Every single morning they got up and they saw the inevitability of what was taking place for two and a half months straight. 1,000 against 15,000, you're not going to make it. Especially when you've got your families, your wives and your children there with you. Every day it inch closer. Every day, the feeling got deeper of what was to come. You know, it'd be one thing if you're just simply soldiers and you're at the Alamo and you're fighting to the last man. But it's a whole other thing when your wives and your kids are standing behind you. 
on May 3rd, in the evening, the Romans pushed up a siege tower, 70 feet tall, with an interior ramp, and started beating on the walls. By the evening, they had broken through. Here's some of the ballistia stones that they threw, and you can see how massive they are compared to us sitting next to them. That's what was going through the walls. I want to read you this. This is from Josephus. Uh, that picture right there, this is, this is where they broke through, okay? Here the siege of Masada ended. The ramp that the Romans had built up to the summit of the mountain reached below this point. At the top of the ramp's ramp rose a siege tower, and in it was a battering ram with which the Romans assaulted the casement wall. However, the rebels had built a wall of earth and wood against which the battering ram was made ineffective. So they built this wall. They had their regular wall, and then they filled it in with as much dirt and wood as they could to protect themselves even, even further. But it was no good. This is a quote by Josephus. Observing this, Silva, thinking it was easier to destroy this wall by fire, ordered his soldiers to hurl at, at the shower of burning torches, torches and arrows, etc. At the first outbreak of fire, a north wind, which blew in the faces of the Romans, caused them alarm, for the div diverting the flame from above it drove it against them. So anyways, what happened was they shot. The wind blew up against them. It actually caught their siege tower on fire, killed some of their own soldiers. And the Jews took this as a sign from God. But it was very short-lived. Then suddenly the wind veering, as if by divine providence, to the south, and blowing with full force in the opposite direction, wafted and flung the flames against the wall, which now through and through was all ablaze. The Romans that night, after they broke through the wall, instead of charging in to wipe them out, knowing that they had won, just simply left. They backed up their siege tower, they walked back down the hill, and they celebrated. They had a massive drunken party that night, celebrating because they knew the next day there wasn't a thing these thousand people could do against them, these untrained people. That night, the Jewish leaders, knowing that the game is up, all met and made a decision that would be very difficult to make. Eliezer ben Yari, who was the leader of the Masada Sakari, gathered all of the leaders, the seven-day leaders, together. And he gave a speech, and I want to read for you some of the speech. This is just excerpts of it. Whoops. Hey, where'd you go? There it is. He said, Since long ago, my generous friends, resolved never to be servants to the Romans, nor to any other than God himself, who alone is the true and just Lord of mankind, the time is now come that obliges us to make the resolution true in practice. Let us not at this time bring a reproach upon ourselves for self-contradiction. While we formerly would not undergo slavery, though it, were, though it were then without danger, but must now, together with slavery, choose such punishments also as are intolerable. I mean this, upon the supposition that the Romans once reduce us under their power while we are still alive. We were the very first that revolted from them, and we are the last that fight against them. And I cannot but esteem it as favor that God hath granted us, that it is still in our power to die bravely, and in a state of freedom which hath not been the case of others who, will, who were conquered unexpectedly. It is very plain that we should be taken within a day's time. But it is still an eligible thing to die after a glorious manner, together with our dearest friends. That's one thing. But he continues and says, let our wives die before they are abused. Let our children before they, are, they have tasted slavery and after we have slain them. 
Let us bestow that glorious benefit on one another mutually and preserve ourselves in freedom as an excellent funeral monument for us. But first, let us destroy our money and the fortress by fire. For I am well assured that this will be bitter a bitter blow to the Romans, that they shall not be able to seize upon our bodies and shall fail to our wealth also. Let us spare nothing but our provisions, for they will be a testimonial when we are dead, that we are not subdued for want of necessities. But that, according to our original resolution, we have preferred death to that, excuse me, that we have preferred death, that we are not subdued for want of necessities. But according to our original resolution, we have preferred death before slavery. So they decided to burn down all of their supplies. The reason all of these storehouses are literally taken down by the stone is that night while all of Rome was partying down below, they were setting fire to all of their food, everything they owned. And all they did left was they left this one bay completely full to show the Romans we had enough. And we stood anyway. And you can't have any. Imagine, you know, the, the soldiers, they love to pillage, right? They love to raid. They love to get for whatever you can gain after the war is all your booty. It's yours. But not on this mountain. That's why it all looks like this. <laughs> this is what they left for the Romans. And that's the only bay that was left. But they weren't done yet. This is believed to be where Eliezer gave his final speech that night. And they chose by lots among the 70 elders to not die as slaves. Josephus, this is a quote, says, The Romans, expecting further opposition the next day, were at a loss to conjecture what had happened. Here encountering, encountering the mass of the slain, instead of exulting over enemies, they admired the nobility of their resolve and their contempt for death displayed by so many in carrying it out unwaveringly, unwaveringly to execution. Each man of the 70 elders took his family and killed his own wife and child, all of them, came back together and drew these lots that you see here, pieces of pottery with their names on them. And two by two, they'd flip a coin and the one would kill the other until the last man standing fell on his own sword. I knew this story before I ever made it to Masada. And I went through the Holocaust Memorial there in Israel. And it was moving and it was powerful. But this entire place shook me because I knew the decision they made. Can you imagine pent-up rage for months of hard work and heat? One bucket at a time, pouring that out, being a target for the enemy. Wanting so desperately to pillage and rape and murder everyone in sight when you cross those walls. And as they get up through the next morning, they don't find anybody defending the walls. Everything is silent. You cross through the walls and all you see are families. Wives and children and fathers laying over each other in piles. A thousand strong. They said that when the commander of the army, Silva, over those 15,000 men, when he crossed the wall, he was literally speechless because the Romans hadn't won. They couldn't take what the last thing that those people held, and that was their freedom. I'm not saying what they did was right, but man, what a resolve. 
the chief of staff of the IDF, the Israel Defense Forces, initiated a practice by holding a swearing ceremony after 67 AD. Every youth, as they grow up, are required to serve in the military, in the IDF. Once you complete your boot camp, they take you atop of, Mo of Masada, and it is there that your swearing ceremony takes place. And they say in declaration when they receive their completion, Masada shall never fall again. What a resolve. The problem is, we know from the scriptures that nothing that Israel has ever faced is about to, is as bad as what they will face. Ezekiel tells us it will be the worst time ever where two-thirds of Israel will be destroyed. It's called the time of Jacob's trouble. We can resolve in our hearts all we want. But if we are doing it in the defiance of God's face, you won't put up with it. Israel, out of defiance, for the last 2,000 years, have been storing up a burden that's going to be very hard to bear. But it's coming. One bright thing out of this, though, that I want to leave us with, is I showed you this picture already. They did this dig back in the 1960s. <laughs> Pretty much right after the Six Day War, when they took control over it, they were like, hey, let's start digging this thing up. So they started the archaeological dig, and what they found, dates are a huge part of the diet over there. They found these old date pits that had just been stored away. They'd just been, you know, you chew up a date, you spit it out. No big deal. Like we do with a peach pit or something like that. Well, these goofy things, for 2,000 years, have been setting up on top of this dry mountain, dead as a doornail. So they took them, and they put them in a museum. Until 2016. And they had the bright idea, I just wonder if modern technology, if we can make these dates come to life again. Now, what's cool since the time of Christ, the Romans were so thorough in their destruction of Israel, they burnt every tree. And even up until modern times in the 1900s, when the modern or when the Ottoman Empire had control over Israel, they gave you a tax for every tree you had on your property. And if you're a Jew, you're not going to pay that tax, so you don't have a tree. So for 2,000 years, the Jerusalem, the Israelite dates, have been extinct for 2,000 years. But in 2016, they planted those goofy things, and you'll never guess. <laughs> they sprouted. They came up, and others came up with them. There is a tree that they call Methuselah, oldest man in the Bible. It has come to life again. And it's now producing dates. Here's the cool part. And I've got a video talking about this prophecy. You'll have to go back way back in my YouTube channel to find it. But there's a prophecy. You remember when Jesus came into Jerusalem and they were waving palm branches? Remember? You know where the palm branch comes from? <laughs> Date trees. For 2,000 years, they have never been able to wave those palm branches again for their Mashiach. But now, they can again. They can wave it for their Mashiach. They're not going to like it once they do. But we have literally seen a prophecy. All of us in here, that prophecy has been fulfilled in our time for our day, in our lives. Folks, <laughs> buckle your seatbelts. Well, I hope it's been interesting to see Masada 
Like I said, I wish I'd have had more of the verses and all. I didn't have time to put that in there uh, for the study. But I do hope you uh, you look into that. And I, if you need the link to that video, I can I can send it to you. And it's got I've got all the verses and everything in that. I did it several years ago, or at least two years ago. Um, but I hope I hope it was at least eye opening and challenging to be thankful for what we do have. We do live in a messed up nation. It's getting worse than I every day. But I am thankful for the freedom that I do have. I'm thankful for it. And I hope that when the time comes, I will be able to stand and fight for it again. Let's pray. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for watching. It really does mean the world to me that you're getting a blessing out of it. If this video was a blessing, make sure to hit that thumbs up button for me. That way other people can find it as well. Here in the link section, you'll find playlists and new videos that we put out. We try to do two or three a week. You can also subscribe to the channel uh, by pressing on my face and then hitting the bell icon, and that will alert you to new videos. May God richly bless you.